Hello everyone, welcome to my channel and in today's video we are going to discuss a very high yield topic which is ADHD. Uh, so both ADHD and autism are very high yield topics for UKMLA exam and also for many other exams as well because um, these cases um, when you are when you are taking history and when you are providing management you have to combine both your psychiatric history taking skills and periodic history taking skills uh, because these patients, the ADHD and autism patients, as both these disorders are neurodevelopmental disorders, which is they are present at birth. Okay, so the patient, the patient population who usually present with these disorders are going to be either uh, school going children, so age four um, and five. Um, most often, it's the school going children because when the child is, um, you know, newborn child, um. You can't really tell if he's ADHD or autism, but as, as a child uh, keeps growing in toddler stage, the parents might overlook these symptoms and they might think that it's it's uh, it's just a phase and that's going to pass. But once the child start going to school um, and then um, they start noticing that he's not behaving, he or she is not behaving like other kids and also um, teachers start uh, starts noticing uh, the symptoms and then this is the time uh, when these patients usually present to uh, you know to the uh, health services so the presenting complaint here is going to be behavioral issues um the same presenting complaint uh, the presenting complaint is basically the same for adhd autism a few other um, a few other uh, you know conditions like a positional defiance disorder or maybe the normal um, normal childhood temper tantrums uh, presenting complaint is going to be the same behavioral issues so you'll have to explore your presenting complaint first so you'll ask the parent can they please elaborate a bit more on what they mean by behavioral issues okay and then you need to establish when did it start okay when did it all start and in cases of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and ADHD um, the parent will say They've been like this as long as they can remember, as long as um, um, right from the time when they started talking um, and when they started interacting socially, they've been like this, okay? And uh, in other conditions, like for example, uh, a positional defiance disorder, there must be a trigger, um, like for example, um, a change in school, um, parents separation, uh, addition of new sibling to the family. So there must be a trigger uh, to kind of um, to provoke that kind of behavioral problem from the child. But in case of ADHD and autism, uh, this will be present at birth. OK, so you need to ask like specifically any significant event after which it started, because if it started after a significant event, then it can just be the reaction to that event because children can't really process complex emotion and can't really express their emotions um the way adults can do so what what usually happen is if child if a child is going through a lot of complex emotions they start acting out okay so you need to ask this question to kind of establish the um you know the establish the etiology and then uh, another question would be is the behavior consistent or does it vary okay so if it's ADHD and autism, um, the behavior is going to be consistent. But if it's um, a reactional kind of thing, then the then then you know the symptoms would vary, um, depending on the time of the day, depending upon the setting that they are in. For example, they will be acting differently at home. They will be acting differently when they are playing with their uh, friends, and they will be acting differently when they are at school. But uh, for autism and ADHD, the behavior is going to be consistent at all times and in different settings, okay? Then uh, when the parent tell you about, you know, when they elaborate on the behavioral problem and they tell you that, you know, um, our child, he he always like, he's always restless. He cannot, you know, um, always fidgeting with something. He cannot relax and, um he have like difficulty in sleeping uh, he cannot wait for his turn keeps interrupt uh, interrupting other people etc then you uh, will have an idea of where uh, you know um where 
they are taking you in terms of the diagnosis. So you need to explore other symptoms to kind of confirm your diagnosis. So you need to ask these questions. So basically, as the name suggests, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's basically a spectrum um, of two different symptoms. One is inattention and the other is hyperactivity. So you have to ask, uh, you know, um, questions to establish their degree of inattention, okay? So last question like, does he struggle, uh, does he struggles to focus on task and get easily distracted? Are they able to complete their uh, schoolwork on time? Um, are they uh, forgetful and keep losing important things, okay? And you can ask questions like, do, like, do you feel that he's not, he or she is not listening to you when spoken to directly? Okay, so the thing with ADHD children is they have their their brain jumps from one place to another all the time. Uh, so they are not able to focus on a single task and they can get easily distracted and, um, you know, a, a small task can take them hours and hours. So they always struggle with routine and with kind of um, performing their schoolwork on time Um with the exception of video games, because even in the history, you can ask the parent uh, or the parent might voluntarily tell you that uh, they can play hours and hours and um, video games um, for hours on an end. So that's the only thing that he, he or she can focus on. But otherwise, they are very easily distractible um, and they are very forgetful and keep losing their uh, important things. OK. Then you need to establish the symptoms of hyperactivity because for diagnosis of ADHD, you need to establish inattention and you, do, you need to establish hyperactivity. So you need to ask questions like, is he always fidgety and restless? Does he always keep running around, talks excessively and interrupt others, can't wait for his turns, et cetera? So these are basically the symptoms of hyperactivity. And then to confirm a diagnosis of ADHD, it must be present in two different settings, that is at home and at school. And it is the same is the case with autism. So the behavior must be consistently present in two different settings, okay? So you need to ask these questions. In this question here, it's really, really important. So don't kind of um, forget to ask this question because it will kind of seal the diagnosis of ADHD here. So um, ask the parent, are these behaviors noticeable both at home at school, okay? So then you need to rule out other differential diagnosis. So you have asked, you have explored the behavioral issue, which was the presenting complaint. And then you ask questions about hyperactivity. Then you ask questions about inattention. And then you ask question about uh, the presence of these symptoms in different settings. But then you need to rule out other differential diagnosis like autism, oppositional defiance disorder, and seizure disorder. So in autism, um, the the child will be like the child prefers to stay alone and they have like one favorite hobby, uh, for example, playing with a red truck or playing with uh, trains and they keep doing uh, the same hobby again and again and again. Um, uh, they might, you know, use some repetitive words or repetitive uh, bodily movement. And they always avoid to, you know, um, they always avoid eye contact. Um, even when you are directly speaking to them, and they don't get along, uh, get along well with other children. And uh, autist, like autistic kids, have, you know, insistence. They always insist on sameness. So any change in their routine can, you know, trigger um, a huge emotional response from them. Okay. So you need to ask these questions to rule out autism. So I'll ask the parent, do they get along with other children? Um, do they maintain eye contact when spoken to? Any repetitive moments or words? So basically ADHD children, they are just very restless and they are not able to focus on one thing or the other. And they're always running around, but they are quite social and they like to play with other children and they don't have as much problem um, in sharing. Um, and every child has a favorite toy or, uh, you know, a favorite hobby. But in autism, it's it's like um, it's on the extreme um, side of things. So the child might just play with the red truck 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, and um, not care much about any other toy. There might be some repetitive movement like swinging their arm or circling that they can do like for hours and hours on end. And they never like to, uh, you know, um, never like eye contact or being touched or uh, any social interaction. Okay, so you need to ask these questions to rule out autism. This is also very, very important differential. Um, then we have a positional defiance disorder. So positional defiance disorder is basically a fancy name for um, children acting out. So there is almost always there is a known trigger, a significant event, for example, uh, parent separation or the birth of a new sibling or um, they have recently moved their houses or schools. Okay, so there is always this trigger which is present and there is always, you know, the parent will tell you, uh, oh, the symptoms started like four months ago. So there is always like a specific timeline for the symptoms. In a positional defiance disorder, um, children, they don't listen to their parents and teachers, but it's not because of inattention. It's because they are intentionally trying to challenge their parents and their teachers. So they're kind of challenging their authority and they keep, you know, um, uh, they keep arguing with their parents and their teachers and keep fighting with their uh, peers or siblings and they try to intentionally, you know, break rules at home and at school. And ADHD, uh, a child might break rules like, for example, standing in a queue or waiting for their turn because they are very hyperactive. So it's kind of an ADHD. It's more of an impulse control thing, whereas an oppositional defiance disorder, the child is doing it intentionally. It's not because of impulse control or hyperactivity. They're just taking out their anger and frustration because of some significant event. So you need to ask this question to establish um, to kind of rule out a positional defiance disorder. So you'll ask the parent, do they often get in arguments with you or are there teachers? Do they seem to intentionally break rules at home and at school and try to challenge, you know, authority figures? So that was a positional defiance disorder. Then another important differential is seizure disorder. So Absence seizure is a common type of seizure in children and sometimes they can get as many episodes and they can get like 20 to 30 episodes per day. And during the episode, it's like a very short lived episode and the child just go vacant and blankly stare. And then after um, the seizure is over, they just resume their activity. So seizure might last for half a minute or a minute. And then they kind of they are not able to remember anything that happened during the episode so it can present very very similar to adhd because if a child is is at school and the teacher is um kind of trying to teach a topic and, and the child is having these seizures um like every five minutes uh, for the child the teacher is like jumping forward in time because during the seizure he's not aware of anything that's happening around him so it is very easy to mistake an absence seizure disorder with um, attention deficit, okay? So you also need to rule that out. So you need to ask the parent, have you ever noticed episodes where your child stares blankly into the space or lose awareness without remembering it afterward, okay? So you need to establish whether the child is having these episodes where they like stare blankly or kind of appear as they've lost their awareness of the surrounding and they're not able to remember it afterwards, okay? Then um, this was basically your history of presenting illness where you have confirmed your diagnosis by asking specific questions and then you have ruled out other differential diagnoses. Then you're going to ask about any medical conditions, so any physical health disorders at all, any medical condition that the child has been diagnosed with, any allergies, any medications that the child is uh, taking. Family history. Family history is also very important because there is a certain genetic link in both ADHD and autism. So you need to ask the parent any family history of ADHD or behavioral issues. And then like in all pediatric cases, we need to ask about the birth. Um, so as the as time is limited uh, up to eight minutes in the station, you can't really 
go into asking before birth and after birth and um, like the detailed history because uh, the history taking here is also quite um, quite detailed so it would be better if you just ask a question um did you face any com uh, no uh, did you face any complications when you were pregnant uh, with this child and um you know are any complications afterward were they born at uh, you know a term or were they premature so just like two two or three questions here and then i stands for immunization so are they up to date with their immunization and r stands for the red book so red book is basically uh, developmental milestones so just ask the parent that um you know did they uh, reach their milestones at appropriate age were they able to walk and, and talk at appropriate age or, or were they a bit delayed okay this is again very very important because sometimes learning disabilities can be uh, or delayed milestones can be confused with um behavioral issues okay so developmental milestone is a very very important question here and then d stands for diet so you can ask about their their diet and their appetite and their sleep etc so bird is basically an acronym which you need to um ask in every pediatric case which is birth and uh, so antenatal and postnatal issues and immunization red book and diet okay then you will ask about any ideas, any thoughts on why the child, why the child is behaving that way, anything that they are concerned about, and anything that they were hoping uh, that you would do for them today. Okay, so ideas, concerns, and expectations, and then we come to the management part. So in management, um, it will start with you explaining the condition to the parent. Okay. So I'll tell the parent that ADHD is a very common condition that affect focus and impulse control, and in some cases, activity levels, making it hard for children to sit still or to concentrate on a specific task, okay? So don't go, uh, go on telling the parent that this is a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, because it's they're, they're not going to get it, it's, and you will be marked for medical jargon. So explain it, explain to them in very simple layman terms that it, this is a, a very common condition. That is, this is important to tell them that the condition is quite common because when you tell a person that their child has got so and so behavioral issues um, or a behavioral disorder, they're going to be quite worried. So uh, to reassure them, it's important to tell them that ADHD is quite common and it affects um, impulse control, uh, focus, and activity levels, making it hard for children to sit still or concentrate because their brain is jumping um, from, you know, from one thought to another and to another. And the same way their body is just full of activity and, um, and they just want to keep moving at all time. So the good news is that with the right strategies, most children do very well. And then you will explain the treatment. So basically treatment in ADHD is both medications and behavioral therapy, okay? So you will tell a little bit about uh, both of them. So in behavioral therapy, you will tell the parent that a therapist will work with you and with your child to develop ways to manage behaviors, okay? So basically what happened in behavioral therapy is a therapist work with the, with the parent and tell and, and, you know, explain to them some strategies that um, and some changes that they can do in the home environment to help the child better cope with their symptoms. And in the same way, they explain um, to the teachers and to the school uh, what changes they can do in their environment and what kind of um, techniques they can use to help the child concentrate more. So you'll tell the parent that a therapist will work with you and your child to develop ways to manage behaviors like breaking tasks into smaller steps. So instead of giving them one lengthy task, just give them, um, you know, small tasks, um, like a series of small tasks, uh, and they will be able to better focus um, on them. And uh, setting up like appropriate routines because in ADHD, for ADHD people, routine is very, very important. So make sure that they have you know a healthy routine that they follow um throughout the week okay um also mention that school support is essential teacher can make certain adjustment in the classroom like usual reminders or 
um, you know, breaking again, breaking a task into smaller steps, um, which will help the child stay more focused and tell the parent that um, we, we will all work together as a team. So you as a doctor and then uh, the school staff and then the parents and then the therapist, and we will have regular follow-up meetings to see um, how our strategies are working and how we can do better, okay? And then regarding medication, tell the parent that um, sometimes we also consider some medications. Um, stimulants like methylphenidate are often prescribed uh, to children with ADHD. And these medications, they help improve uh, focus and attention and control impulses, okay? So, um, so for ADHD, basically, we have stimulants and non-stimulants. Stimulants are, are medications like methylphenidate, and then non-stimulants are medications like atomoxidin. So mostly, uh, stimulants are prescribed, and they kind of help the, help the brain to kind of relax and not jump as much. Um, and it also, and so it leads to improved focus and improved attention and, and the control of impulses. Sometimes for some people, stimulants don't work. So then we need to prescribe non-stimulant medications like atomoxetine. But no need to go into such detail explaining all of it to the parent. Just say that uh, we might consider some medications who, uh, which help, which will help with um, improved focus and attention. Um, but if they want to ask you um, about specific medication, then you can explain it to them, okay? And tell them that you will be doing regular follow-ups to see if there are any side effects of the medication or if, they, or if you need to, you know, increase or decrease the dose. Um, so, yeah, so tell the parent that you will be supporting them in every step of the way and you will all be working uh, as a team. And again, reassure them that it's not, um, you know, um, it's not a very rare disorder, it's very, very common and it's also very, very manageable. So with with medication and with behavioral therapy, the child will be able to do very well, both academically and generally in life. Um, Sometimes because these are, it's a neurodevelopmental disorders and these are kind of psychotropic medications, parents might be concerned that they can cause, you know, growth delays or dependence. So you might need to explain that sort of things to them that there is no evidence that these, um, that these medication cause growth delay or dependence. Um, and these are very, very safe medic safe and research proven medication. Um, so that was all about ADHD. Uh, I hope it was helpful. And if you are finding my videos helpful, please subscribe to my channel and also share with other people who might need it. And I'll see you soon in the next video.